Thanks so much. Uh, it's fun to be here tonight, and I'm um, looking forward to talking more with Gail after. And um, it's uh, th there's so much that you brought up that I want to touch on now. So I'm uh, I'm just thinking a little bit about how to start here, but. Um, I think for me, uh, when I began thinking about how I wanted to talk to you all tonight about the opportunity gap, um, I really got to thinking about my own story and thinking about how I came to understand uh, the opportunity gap that we have in Minneapolis. And I think there's a lot of parallels between what Gail talked about and what I'm going to talk about uh, that hopefully, hopefully you'll see. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my own experience as a young person and then um, as I became a college student and experienced uh, starting to work for the Minneapolis Beacons Network that really helped me to see uh, the opportunity gap that we have in our city. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the ways in Beacons that we think about trying to close that opportunity gap. And one of the things that, Gail, you talked about that really resonated for me is this idea that uh, what's sometimes disappointing in youth work is that you say, well, this isn't innovative, this is simple. This is something that we should be doing for young people. So um, hopefully, uh, you'll, uh, hopefully you'll hear some of that as I talk. So um, this is me up here with my sister, Leah, who's in the audience, uh, growing up in South Minneapolis. Um, and the opportunity gap, as we talk about opportunities for young people, is really about uh, these 2,000 hours that we know that young people like this have that are discretionary, that they can fill their time with when they're not sleeping and when they're not at school. Um, and so as we think about how young people fill their time with opportunities to learn and grow, uh, one of the things that we also need to be paying attention to is who has access and who doesn't to those different kinds of opportunities. So here I am. Let's see if I can figure out the... There we go. So here I am, a little bit older. Yep, that's me. You can laugh. It's OK. The braces, the glasses, uh, there's me up there. So at this age, I'm probably a little bit closer to 12 years old. And so by this point in my experience, in my out-of-school time experience, um, I am uh, now a student at, at uh, Barton Open School in South Minneapolis. Uh, in the summers, I'm spending time at YMCA camps and other kinds of camp and child care kinds of opportunities. Um, and I have the privilege of spending time sometimes going with my family to see a play or to uh, see a museum. And so uh, my experience growing up in South Minneapolis uh, is not only shaped by my experiences at home and my experiences at school, but also how I'm filling those 2,000 hours uh, outside of that time. And so uh, one of the things that's kind of, uh, uh, I had developed an, uh, kind of a nasty habit by this age, though, and my parents may or may not know this, but I had become kind of a soap opera addict by about this age. So uh, one thing that was true is that when my parents were working, if I was left at home on a release day or in the summer, I could start at 11 AM with uh, Young and the Restless, move to Days of Our Lives, One Life to Live, Santa Barbara. And by the time my parents came home at 5 or 6, I'd be like, oh, I just turned the TV on. So uh, not a very dramatic example, but the reality is young people, regardless of where they are, uh, they are going to fill their time with things we want them to be doing and things that we don't want them to be doing. Um, and that's part of the job of young people and one of the tasks of adolescence, right? Um, so one thing happened for me as I was about this age, and it's just one example of the kind of opportunity that can show up in a young person's life. Um, and for me, this young woman here, right in the center here, between the two blonde boys, uh, her name's Laura Balfour. And she was, at that time, a, a high school student at the Arts High School. And she had begun to start her own dance company in her parents' basement. And so Laura came to me at about this age, and she said, Jenny, I have a job for you. I want you to teach dance. And I said, sounds great, Laura, but we have a problem because I don't know how to dance. And she said, well, it's fine. You're smart. You'll figure it out. And she gave me a book on dance. And she said, start taking my classes for free, and you'll figure it out. And pretty soon, and I didn't realize, she was just really very sick of dealing with the, uh, the four-year-olds. So pretty soon, I was in charge. I had this great opportunity that she bestowed upon me of being in charge of the four-year-olds. So I'm about this age, and I'm leading this little pack of four-year-olds up and around her house, and we're pretending we're moving our bodies through peanut butter, and we're pretending we're moving through jello. And pretty soon, I came to see that even without knowing how to dance, I could figure it out. I could learn enough about a plie 
or enough about some basic ways to get young people moving that I could start to do this. And so the Search Institute talks about this as finding your spark. And for me, this was one moment where I found a spark that really didn't have anything to do with dance. Uh, but it was about facilitating and connecting with young people. It was about uh, creating environments where people could thrive. And so, you know, in some weird way I didn't know about at that time, I was preparing to be an executive director of the University Y and the Beacons Network at that age. And so, um, so that, you know, that's how this stuff can work. Sometimes it's formal in a formal youth program, uh, and often it's really informal in a community setting with a parent, with an elder, um, or just showing up in a library or park, those kinds of settings. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't be very intentional about how we create those opportunities for young people. So I wasn't invited here to talk today because I have such an interesting story, but I, um, I think more so to talk about the work of our Beacons work. But for me, my story really, um, as we think about the opportunity gap, starts when I uh, was a college student working an internship, uh, starting with the brand, at that time, brand new Minneapolis Beacons project. And so I began working in a school that on paper should have been exactly like the school that I attended. It was a K-8 open school in Minneapolis public schools. And everything on paper looked the same. And yet when I set foot into the school and began working with the young people at Webster School, many of whom were from low-income communities, many of whom were from communities of color, I found that we have a totally different situation in Minneapolis than I realized. And I, this was a time where I thought I understood Minneapolis. I thought I understood Minneapolis public schools. And yet, for me, this was a, a moment where I really saw that we have this invisible curriculum in Minneapolis and in Minneapolis public schools, and we don't name it and we don't talk about it, but it has to do with those 2,000 hours and how young people fill it up. And of course, it also has, how young people thrive has to do with what happens at home and what happens in the school as well. But this 2,000 hours in a year that a young person has to fill with opportunities, that was what I began to see as I worked with young people uh, through the Beacons Network. They were so hungry for the kinds of opportunities that we were bringing in for the first time. We used to joke that we'd walk into the lunchroom and it was like, you'd feel like Beyonce. I, I had to get my little Beyonce plug in there tonight. Uh, so you'd feel like Beyonce, they'd go, Beacons! And you'd, and you'd like be, why are they so excited to see me? And you'd realize it wasn't about me. It was about the fact that we were bringing in something new, something fresh, something exciting, and building relationships with them in a way that hadn't happened for them in that setting before. And so uh, as I began doing this work with Beacons, for me, it really opened my eyes to the fact that we have this wide opportunity gap in our, in our, um, in our city. As I began learning a little bit more about the research, one of the, thing, one of the studies that I um, came across is by Robert Putnam, which shows that over the last 40 years, everybody has increased the amount of money they're spending on opportunities for young people in the non-school hours. So low-income families, middle-income families, upper-income families are all spending more money on creating the kinds of experiences for young people where they can thrive. Um, but the gap is widening, and it's widening exponentially. So uh, upper-income families are spending $5,300 more now than they were 40 years ago each year on a child. Whereas low-income families are having a hard time catching up, they're spending uh, about $480 more a year. And so everyone's trying to do more and fill the time outside of the school day with the kinds of opportunities young people need to be successful in this economy, to be successful in this democracy, and yet uh, we're allowing this invisible curriculum to be handed out in really different doses to young people depending on their race, depending on their income, depending on geography, and a variety of other factors. And so that became really important to me. Um, oops, sorry. So I wanted to give an example of, so what can we do about that? So the Minneapolis Beacons Network is a partnership led by the YMCA, um, but in partnership with the Boys and Girls Clubs, community education with Minneapolis Public Schools, and the YWCA. And so one example uh, of how we approach this in Beacons is our Beacons Leadership Camp. And as a college student, that was one of the first opportunities I had with young people uh, through Beacons as an intern was to go out into a camp. This was a Y camp I had attended as a child and I had worked at in the summers. Um, and all of a sudden, I was seeing it through different eyes because I was going up to this camp with young people, many of whom had not ever been this far out of the city, hadn't been out of their neighborhood. Um, I had a young person ask me, why are there all these sticks on the ground? 
Um, and, and tougher questions too, like Jenny, is there KKK out here? Right? And so I began to have these profound experiences of seeing the world I had lived in through really different eyes. Um, and so one of the things that was so powerful about this Beacons Leadership Camp experience is that we not only gave young people um, an opportunity to try something they wouldn't have otherwise had access to, like attend a camp, um, but we also made the connection back into their world and their community. And so one of the things we did was, uh, first of all, identify a team of youth leaders from each of the Beacons schools. And these weren't necessarily who the teachers would have said were the leaders. These weren't necessarily the kids who'd ever been told they were leaders before. So we worked in partnership with youth development folks and with folks who really had strong relationships with young people and said, who are the folks who have influence over their peers? Who are the folks who can have the capacity to lead? And so we would take a group of young people, typically about 10 to 20 per school, up to this overnight camp retreat, and they'd have an opportunity to do the high ropes course, and they'd have an opportunity to really talk about what are the issues that you're concerned about in your community and make plans to take, those, take, to take action when they returned home. But I think what was most important about that experience was that young people, young leaders, heard from other young leaders. These are our big homies up here. This is the high school leaders who plan and lead the camp experience. The young people heard from other young people, we need you. We can't solve the problems that we have in our communities and our schools without you. We need you. And for many of these young people, it was the first time they were told they're a leader. The first time they were told, we need your help in solving these problems. And so one of the things that I noticed as a center director is that when we would return back almost every year, there would be a teacher who would pull one of us aside, one of the youth workers aside, and say, what did you do at that camp? What did you do? What did you say? We'd say, well, you know, nothing. It's easy. It's just simple stuff, right? We told them, we told them they're important. We told them their voice mattered. Um, and, and that school staff would often say, this young person is completely different this week than they were last week before you went. They're different in the classroom. Or we would have a parent reach out and say, this young person is different at home. And so much of that really came down to telling them, you have a light that you need to shine, and we need it. So that's Beacon's Leadership Camp. Um, when we talk about the opportunity gap, one of the things that I think is a danger is that we can think that the gap is in the young people, and we really need to talk about the gap as being in our community. So, um, hey, I'll, yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> so I want to make sure when we talk about opportunity gaps, when we talk about achievement gaps, we understand that what we're talking about is what's the environment we create for young people, and, and how do we make sure that we're sort of allowing young people access to the kinds of opportunities that they can thrive in inequitable ways, right? And so um, this isn't about deficit. This isn't about saving a young person. This isn't about um, fixing a young person or a family or a community that's broken. But what it is about is saying we have gaps in terms of how young people are accessing things. <coughs> Excuse me. So, uh, so I wanted to give another example. I talked about a programmatic example, which was Beacons Camp, but I wanted to give a policy example. So um, the original Beacons, when Beacons first started in New York City, I like to tell the story about how Beacons first started in New York City, because I think it gives a great example of how this isn't just about providing programs, it's really also about policies that we can put into place as a city or as a school district that think differently about opportunities and about closing opportunity gaps. So the, um, when Beacons first began in New York City, there was, uh, New York City was facing a crime wave, there was a crack epidemic, there were challenges that the mayor at that time, the Dinkins administration, was trying to address. Um, and the strategy, Ella, thank you. This is my niece, Ella. Thank you. So the Dinkins administration was trying to address these crime issues, and the, the, the main strategy at that time was, well, we need more police on the streets. And so uh, young people and parents and community organizations had a different perspective. And there was a mom who said, you know, you lock the school doors every day at 3 o'clock, and then you expect different results from our young people. Um, and community organizations, if you've heard of the Harlem Children's Zone, uh, the, the organization that became the Harlem Children's Zone was one of those community organizations that was saying, you know, we need access to schools. If we can get into the schools, we can reach young people where they are, and we can provide the kinds of supports that we're ready to provide. 
And so someone in the Dinkins administration basically took a look at the city budget. And one of the things that they saw in the budget that was a line item for the next year's budget was a barge, a prison barge. And they determined that if they made minor adjustments to low-level uh, low level offender sentences, that they could actually reduce the need to buy a prison barge that next year. And they took a million dollars that they would have put into a prison barge, and they invested it into the first ever citywide out-of-school time effort. And with that Beacon's work in the early 90s, there came uh, a national adaptation that brought it to Minneapolis. Excuse me. Um, there also, uh, after that, came a wave of after-school programs growing across the country through the 21st Century Grant and other funding sources. And so that was one example where they really changed the lens that they were approaching policy with. And instead of just responding and reacting to a problem, they turn to listen to the voices of young people and families and community organizations and say, how do we address the root cause of this problem? And so the design of Beacons is really to turn a school into this active community center after school, in the evening, on the weekends, and to really build up on those assets from within a community so that it wasn't about taking young people out of their neighborhood. It wasn't about coming in and fixing a neighborhood. It was about really positioning young people and families and communities to lead themselves. And I think that's really critical when we think about the moment we're in right now in our country and in our community. We have a lot of communities that are hurting people that are afraid, um, and here in Minneapolis, we continue to deliver outcomes and results that are unacceptable, particularly for communities of color and low-income young people. And so we have to challenge ourselves to think differently in our policy solutions, and I just love that story because I think it's an example of looking really differently and creating a policy design that really lifts up uh, the people who are most affected by the problems to help solve them and address them themselves because people have answers to the problems that affect them. How am I on time? Sorry. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to close with this photo. This is Abdul and my daughter, uh, Helen. And um, Abdul is a young man who was one of the young people in that early, he wasn't in the earlier photo, but he's, he was in my life around that time um, when I was working in a Beacon Center. And then we lost touch for a few years and then he showed back up when we opened a high school Beacon. Um, and Abdul was one of these just people with such a light. Um, and we always talk about that and it sounds kind of cliche, but when we talk to young people in Beacons about you are a light, you have a light to shine, uh, it means something to them. And he was one of these young people, just uh, could light up a room. And he, uh, when, we, when we went into Edison, he talked about the difference in that school before Beacons came and after Beacons came in terms of the sense of connection, the sense of young people feeling they mattered and feeling they had a voice. Um, and that always really encouraged me to keep doing this work, keep growing the kinds of opportunities that we grow for young people. Um, we lost Abdul not long ago to violence. Um, and it's something I will just never make sense of in my life. Um, and so this photo for me is kind of, a, it's kind of an open wound. Um, and it's also a, a call to action. And so when I look at this photo, I think about this idea that our stories are all connected and that uh, we all hurt when any one of us hurts, right? And so um, Abdul's down here trying to reach out to my daughter and he said he just wanted a high five. So I was looking, my daughter's now six, she just started kindergarten in Minneapolis Public Schools, and she said, um, she said, well, Mommy, you know, I wish that Abdul was still here. I wish he was still around when I told her that all he wanted was a high five from her. And she said, did I ever give him that high five? And I said, you know, I don't know, Helen, you're always kind of shy. Maybe by the end you might have given him one, but I'm not sure. And she said, I wish he was still here because I wish I could give him that high five. And Obviously, I do too, right? Um, and um, for me, it really, this picture reminds me that this work is never done and that we lose too many young people and um, the work that we're called to do to put programs and policies into practice that build hope, that create spaces for opportunity uh, is critical. 
And Abdul himself, just who he was, calls me to keep doing this work. And I just want to close by saying there's joy here. And we have to also take that joy into the work that we do because that's what Abdul did. That's what so many of our young people continue to do. And so um, if you're looking for a way to take action, for something to do, I would encourage you first and foremost to build spaces that lift up the power and possibility of young people, create spaces that are about hope and joy and possibility. Uh, fund after school programs. We are seeing a decline and it's actually really troubling. Uh, in terms of the investments in after-school programs and opportunities like this for young people. Mentor, formally or informally, the YMCA Achieve Minneapolis provide all kinds of opportunities to do that. And then please continue to support partnerships between community-based organizations and schools because if we can really create that connection between home and community and school, we can really make a difference in terms of the experiences that our Minneapolis young people have. Thank you.